Welcome, everybody. This is, uh, well, this is Spiritual Technologies 2.0 Summit. And I always have a problem getting that out sometimes, but I got it right. Anyway, we have an amazing uh, panel here today. And uh, we've been preparing this for a while. When you have lots of busy, famous, talented, groovy people, sometimes it takes a little bit of effort. It's like when you're creating a new uh, LSD for the first time. The molecules, you know, just have... Uh... Anyway, we got them today. And hopefully it will be a transcendent experience. And Doug, uh, well, anyway, let me introduce everybody. Here we have Doreen. Hi. And I'm John Dupuy, Doug Prater. He is the a communication officer at iAwake, among many other things. We're going to have to expand his title. And this is Alexander Tanous. Tanous. Yeah. Tanous. And here we have uh, John. Voyeur. Voyeur. And down here, last but definitely not least, <coughs> Gu Gubert Finstelle. Yes. Is that more or less in there? Okay. And I, I was sent just uh, uh, bullet points of the stuff that you guys have done and have been involved in. It's a bit overwhelming and intimidating. So I'm just going to let you guys introduce yourselves and uh, to say it's a little, you know, and, and what's most pertinent for our audience here as we uh, discuss the pushing of the boundaries of sound and consciousness. And we have no idea where this is going to go, but I bet it's going to fly. So, um, Doreen, would you like to start the um, uh, just inter introducing yourself and your what your work is about and a little bit about yourself, where you are, etc. Well, sure. Um, my name is Doreen Davis. And I am actually semi retired. So I don't work all the time. And it's lovely because I get to uh, have a life outside of what I've been doing for so many years. But my work is called the Davis model of sound intervention. And mine's not about music, per se. Mine's simply about the waveform energy of the cells of your body and um, a subtle energy system that I discovered that exists between your voice, your ear, and your brain. And as long as I keep that subtle energy system in balance, you function uh, in nature in balance. And when there's some irregular vibration that challenges that balance, then there are ways to bring that back. Um, my background, I am an audiologist by profession and worked for years with the deaf and hard of hearing, worked with assistive devices for the deaf and hard of hearing. Um, and then one, one day way back in the early 1990s, somebody, one of my clients actually introduced me to what I have labeled as a sound-based therapy. Um, and it is more than just using waves of sound or music. It's really using specifically targeted um, therapies that address core issues that people have in what I call in an off-balance mode. So I designed something called the Tree of Sound Enhancement Therapy, which I use as the flow chart for the correct administration of the many different therapies that exist. And I um, designed a diagnostic evaluation for therapy protocol, my DETP, which um, I use the results of the testing that I do for that for following that flow chart of the tree analogy and begin a process of repatterning how the, each individual responds to the vibrational energy in their system, in their body, at the cell level, and also from the external world and how it's influencing it. Um, after I pulled together that and along that way, I also discovered within this voice, ear, brain connection, that if you look at the work of Dr. Alfred Tomatis, who I consider to be the founder of sound-based therapy, when he discovered that your voice produces what your ear hears, and if you reintroduce correcting sounds to the ear, your voice regains stability, my work then measured from an audiological perspective the spontaneous otoacoustic emission of the ear, and I correlated to the irregular patterns in the voice from the work of Sherry Edwards, and further than um, ad advanced what Dr. Tomatis said with what I called the Davis addendum to the Tomatis effect. 
not only does your voice produce what your ear hears, your ear emits the same stress frequencies as the voice, and if you balance the feedback <laughs> here, then your brain can take over and repattern the, the vibrational cellular frequency that needs to, to make the person whole and balanced. So my whole work is um, about creating a self-balance of sound frequencies at the cell level between your voice, your ear, and your brain. And then my later part of my work, I designed a technique called ototoning. Um, and you can actually determine what that spontaneous autoacoustic emission is, your keynote of the day, as I call it. And then you use your voice to ototone that throughout your whole body to feel wonderful in that moment in time. So um, as far as what I'm doing now, as I mentioned, I'm semi-retired, but I see clients, I've moved to be near my daughter and my grandchildren. Um, so I now live in Syracuse, New York. And I um, see people here all, only one day a week if nobody really knows much about my work here. But my clients from New Jersey, where I was for years, really don't want me to stop. So I do go down to New Jersey every three months, and I see clients there. So it's um, a less busy life, but I am enjoying it and plan to share with anyone in the future what my work is about if they want to take it further. So that's, that's my story. Wow, awesome. That's about enough for six months of dialogue. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, Alexander, why don't you be the uh, second batter in the order here. Sure. Um, so my background is uh, in music. I studied at the different degrees in music. I studied uh, theory and composition and uh, I was a performer as well. And I studied conducting for years and wrote contemporary classical music and film music, played classical and jazz. And later on, I did graduate degrees in ethnomusicology. Um, and I started doing field work and my area of specialization was music of West Asia. So that's Turkish, Arabic and Persian musics. And I became interested in microtonality. And um, as most of, us, most of you know, that <clears throat> these musical cultures have uh, various divisions of octaves far more than the Western octave. Western octave is 12, but not only 12, 12 quantized intervals, which is what we call the equal temperament. So I became also interested in uh, the equal temperament versus non-equal temperament and became immersed in the study of non-Western musical cultures, um, being interested in why there are different divisions in the octave from going from 22 tones in the Indian octave to 24 tones in the Arabic and Persian octave and 53 in the Turkish, 72 in the Byzantine, that's the music of the Greek Orthodox Church. So I'm interested in, in the mathematics of sound and their impact on consciousness. And most importantly, how these ancient musical cultures over the centuries, if not thousands of years, most likely, I believe, inherited an advanced knowledge from past advanced and vanished civilizations. This is what we call the Makam system, which stretches from North Africa through Central Asia. Um, basically, uh, sound is more of a technology and these ancient musical cultures have devised musical systems that are not just for entertainment or transcendence, but rather as maintenance for the mind, body, heart, and even the spiritual sense. So the most important part is how these ancient musical cultures have had a practice that is based on how to listen. The judicious, attentive, intentional listening is the most important part. And it's not just what the musician or the sound practitioner can do. It's how it's being received, how the individual can, through listening, go in, into a state uh, of euphoria, of ecstasy, of enchantment, a non-ordinary state of consciousness. In the same way, the Sufis listen to music and through sama, what they call sama, which is judicious listening, they reach a state of al-fana, which is a total dissolution of the ego state of satori or samadhi. So I'm, I'm interested in how one can use sound, specifically designed sound, uh, 
most likely sound that's closer to the blueprint of sound that nature gave us, which is the harmonic overtone series. All the, you know, fine, um, subtle intonations that we don't deal with work anymore with, with, because we deal with an equal tempered system, unfortunately. As beautiful as that is, you know, we drove it in a different direction and Western uh, harmony has made wonderful things. But if you scrutinize what's happening and it, it functions in a completely different way than non-Western musical system. I'm also interested in sound in language in all of the musical aspects in language, not only words, but the inflections, the register, the silence between the words, the accents and the, the enunciation and the articulation, all of these things that are in language that we're losing, unfortunately, because of the extreme use of texting and emailing. So there's no more emotion. So I'm interested in the concept of ethos in music and sound, which deals with emotions. Awesome. Again, another six months of inquiry and dialogue there. Uh, Goubert, would you like yeah. to uh, go next? Yes. Uh, so I have to tell you a little bit of my history, just to understand from how I reached this, this uh, domain of interest. Uh, when I was 18, more or less, I had in mind that in future my profession would be uh, a psychoanalyst. So I began to study children. I began to study philosophy because I to, to understand how humanity uses the brain and the, and the, the language and the, and the way of articulating the thoughts uh, and privately I began to form myself uh, with first a Jungian psychoanalyst and uh, second in you know, a second time with a, with a Freudian psychoanalyst and uh, I began to, to, to work in the usual way with the university with other institutes and as a private psychoanalyst here in me in Italy, but in the same time, uh, I must say I had, I have, and had a great passion for music, especially classical music, that I think has been transmitted to me by my father, who is a non-professional pianist uh, and who uses also now to play Bach often. And I think that uh, hearing Bach before my birth, I think it must be something that in some way structured also my, my mind, my brain, maybe. Uh, so while I was uh, going on with my profession as psychoanalyst, I had this hobby uh, as I'm not playing an instrument as I want, so I, I don't play them. I, I, I sung for some years in a chorus, and that was very beautiful, but I cannot say it was a professional participation. Uh, however, I specialized myself in uh, testing uh, audio devices that reproduces uh, music, amplifiers, uh, speakers, and so on. And I began uh, with a pen name, a uh, collaboration with some uh, reviews uh, specialized in audio, Italian ones. And for years, the, these two areas were separated in my life. That was, I practiced as journalist in audio domain, uh, testing devices and or, uh, in fact, proposing theories that allowed it to understand uh, the relation between uh, uh, electronic measurements, electric measurements, uh, and uh, uh, phenomenological listening. Uh, because often, I don't know if you know it, but often if you measure some devices, you see that the difference between a cheap device and a very, uh, uh, how do you say, it costs much money. Uh, in, if you measure them, you don't see really such big difference that you hear 
when you when you when you participate to a to a listening session. And so I tried with the time to elaborate a theory that allowed it to understand or to, to create a connection between measurements and phenomenology. Uh, shortly, uh, I must say, I, I have in mind that we have to reason by steps, not to read measurements only as linear functions, but the brain works by steps and not in a linear way. Uh, however, one night, I must say, just because I have a philosophical formation, I tried to solve or to, to study something that for me was a problem. And I explained what. Uh, when I record some live events, and I record them with the best microphones that are available on the market and with the best uh, recording uh, sets that, are, that were or are available. Uh, I record it very well, then I listen it to the recorded music at home with, the, I must say, a perfect stereo system. Uh, the sound was perfect, but the magic that, that we can perceive Sometimes, I must say, not always, but sometimes, especially in a, with a classical experience, with a, listening to a classical uh, concert, I, I specify classical because uh, listening to classical music, usually you are sit down and you don't move and you don't speak. So it's something different from uh, listening to a rock concert live in a stadium. It's a different experience, in my opinion. However, this sort of enchantment wants there. And so I began to write an article about what means recording a live event. Uh, the aim was to understand what was missing, wh where was the, the failure, in some, if you can speak in this way. Mm -hmm. And I terminated this article without finding a solution, but uh, taking as an evidence that uh, there must we have must lose something in this process because this magic that I could that all the public could hear and perceive it during this live event wasn't perceivable at home. I must say that during the night I had a sort of intuition uh, that the problem was not uh, researched in the way we record, or not only. Uh, but in the way we reproduce sound. And uh, I must say, found, found a new solution that uh, in, after some months I patented, uh, my, I must say worldwide, that is called, not by me, but it was the examiner of the European Patent Office, that when he understood what I, what, what I was uh, proposing, he gave the name, oh, you have... Uh, uh, found a sort of mirror effect. In fact, the system, the system that is called AVS, that is the acronym of audio standard, the standard of virtual audio, and I will explain shortly what I mean with this, uh, sort of system that simplifying uh, mirrors the sound from behind the same sound that comes from a stereo source that you have in front. If you make a particular operation, uh, the sound that you hear is not what expected by physical laws. That is, uh, you, are, you should not be able to recognize from where the sound is coming. The effect is known in acoustic as front-back confusion. Mm -hmm. It's like when you hear a, a police uh, that is Sorry. coming Sorry. And yeah. from where it's coming. It's because there are reflection over, over your uh, glasses in the car and your brain is unable to understand from where the sound is coming. Uh, this is called front back confusion. It should happen this and also some uh, uh, dilation of uh, specific frequencies if you are not exactly in phase with the signals and this to destroy the quality of the perceived sound. However, uh, the brain is not a microphone. 
And I discovered, I must say, that there is a sort of switch that the brain uh, makes when he is listening to sounds with this system that is exactly going in this state of enchantment that happens sometimes when you're listening to a, when you're listening to a magic uh, live classical concert. So I found, I think, to have found the way to stabilize that experience, independently from what you are hearing, but dependent from how the sound is uh, sent to the hearing system. This is controlled by a software and by the position of the speakers. And the idea is that the brain is induced to utilize the algorithm that he uses when uh, the brain creates honeric experiences when he dreams. When the, I, I say he, but it, I, must, I should say, it, when it dreams. Uh, because the way the sound is coming is not elaborate, it cannot be elaborated by normal perceptive algorithms. So there is a sort of integration, and I call this a transitional way of listening. Transitional because it trans it transgo from a state to another of the of the functionality of the brain. And the idea was if I'm Right, if I don't listen to music with this system, but if I use a non structured sound like pink noise, white noise, or something that has no forms inside and even no rhythm, uh, the, if I'm right, the brain should produce forms in this field. And this, I must say, happened immediately. And uh, if you close your eyes, you have uh, the possibility to hear sounds that are different from the sound stimulus uh, or even see things uh, having the, your eyes closed having visions or having all what ha can happen during dreams like someone who touches you or someone who gives you something to eat or you can speak with a figure that is speaking to you and you speak to this uh, man or woman that you can see in this experience and it seems to be absolutely real the experience uh, so i introduced this way to cure people in my practice and uh, after some years of experimentation uh, i formalized a new way to to, to, to cure people that is it's called PAT sessions, that is psychoacoustical transitional session, uh, where the stimulus that is heard is neutral, and what comes out are, uh, I must say, forms that the subject produces from itself and that uh, are always important for the life of the, of the subject. But what is interesting. I think, is that in this condition, the brain is able to solve by itself the problem. So if, if it happens that you have a coherent vision or a coherent experience, usually you, you have the experience of the, for example, of the representation of a trauma, but with the solution of, the, of, the, of this trauma. Solution in, in both senses as solution as we have found a new way and solution also in a chemical way, so it's dissolved. Uh, sometimes people, uh, and I say, told me, but this session works also for a headache or for uh, panic attacks or for something else that they didn't imagine can, can be cured by this session. And I say, yes, and uh, why do you ask me? Because I, an example, for example, that comes to mind now, a person that never told me that he has panic attack uh, by conducting a car uh, at, after seven, eight sessions told me, but works it also with panic attack? And I say, yes, why you ask me? Because I saw that today I had to take the car because my, my, my man couldn't bring me in some way, I don't know where. And I surprised myself conducting the car without anxiety. So it's something that the subject perceives after he sees that the, that the symptom is dissolved. 
And uh, so this, this system has been sold and is sold uh, as a system for listening to music and or watching films uh, and or for making these sessions. However, some years ago in 2013, uh, I had the idea that it was possible to, or better, I was forced to find another solution that was more uh, comfortable and easy to use and this, uh, we can say, holophonic system that I, I have conceived before. Uh, and information that I didn't give you is that all the tests that we made, uh, phenomenological and bioelectrical, showed that uh, if, for example, we listen to a sound like pink noise with uh, the ABS system tuned in a particular way, we obtain this uh, modulation of the state of consciousness or uh, changing functionality of the brain. It depends if we speak about from a phenomenological or from a clinical or neurological point of view. Mm -hmm. But that if we listen to the same uh, stimulus in stereo, this produces no effects as all the world, I must say, can testimony. Uh, so the idea to put, to, to obtain the same effect with the headphone was not um, followed for many years. But I say, one day I was forced to find a solution and I think I have found, I have found another solution. Uh, that is changing the stimulus and introducing in the stimulus something that uh, the way of sending the, the sounds was done by the ABS system. I must say, I think to have found this solution, and this is another patent request for the whole world, uh, and has been also filed as medical device in Italy and subsequently also for all Europe. And now I'm developing and making research on this device that it's in practice a, a particular headphone with a, with a player with a stored uh, uh, this sound file that is tuned exactly for this headphone. And uh, it is now in test uh, in a, with a, a faculty institution here in Milan for a non-curable symptom that is tinnitus. And it seems the research has not is not ended till now, but what I can say in, in an informal way, or, or better, what I can say following other research that we have made before, uh, it is able to cure tinnitus uh, in more or less the 80% of the champions. That's amazing. And this is not the only uh, clinical application, but the idea is that this stimulus is able to put the brain in a, in a particular state so that the brain itself is able to make a sort of auto-reset of all the specific areas and we have, we have also mapped all the brain and in specific moments. So at first uh, the limbic system is reset, then the insula and then other areas and at the end the frontal areas that are the ones who are more cognitively involved. Uh, we take it as a, as a data, we have measured this, we don't know why it happens this way, by, but it happens always. So, uh, at, at, uh, in, at, at, till now, uh, I must say, the idea is, it is possible to have a specific signal who is able to induce a note, an automatic reset of the brain, in all the people, independently from culture, age, or language, or uh, musical passions, because the stimulus is a completely neutral one. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it seems to, one, be able to cure all psychological and psychiatric diseases, some neurological diseases, like headache, uh, slurred speech, or uh, other diseases. Depression, for example? Absolutely, this is all psychiatric and psychological diseases. When there are no damages, <coughs> and ones, I must say that is incredibly efficient. Uh, and in healthy people, you can uh, experience an increase of peak performances. 
psychical and physical. Wow, thank you. Again, another six months. Oh, boy, so thank you so much. That was absolutely captivating, all of you guys. But John, last but not least, uh, a little about yourself and your work. I like hearing everybody else's work. I prefer that. Uh, I, you know, my work, my academic training is in uh, psycho I'm a psychologist, um, clinical psychologist. I'm also a musician, composer, and uh, I have a licensed uh, naturopathic physician. Uh, and I combine all three. I always have combined all three. Um, I did my music training at Indiana University with a composer named Ioannis Zanakis. So that's, that makes me pretty much interested in math and sound for sure. And I came to New York City to be with John Cage. Uh, and I also have a master's degree in classical piano. So I understand classical music quite well. Uh, but I'm also very much into very modern music and atonality and microtones and so on. Uh, I came to New York City in 1973 to do research and work at Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital. Uh, and while I was doing that research, I was in a laboratory, my laboratory actually, uh, where we had a lot of rats. And uh, in the corner of the laboratory, there was a little room on wheels, and it was, uh, uh, I recognized it as an anechoic chamber. It was built, I didn't know this at the time, but it was put there in the 1950s by the CIA to do deprivation experiments with LSD. So uh, it just happened to be sitting there, no one knew what it was, everybody had forgotten it. And I basically had the ability to sit in this anechoic chamber in basically what an engineer would call total silence and darkness. And uh, I would sit and I would listen to the sounds in my body. Uh, I listened to my heart beating, my blood circulating. And I especially got interested in my nervous system uh, and how it would create a sound or sounds. Uh, this was based on the feedback I got from engineers at the time. John, this, this was just with your naked ears with no... No, no, no it, nothing external. Only me sitting in a room by myself in total darkness and silence. Wow. Uh, and sometimes I'd be in that room for five minutes, sometimes for four, six, seven hours at a time. Uh, and I did this over a period of a, at least a year, year and a half. But at one point, I was, of course, I was doing what I call phenomenological research. I was keeping track of everything and making a diary. Uh, but at one point, uh, I got an argument in New York City with someone at a, soul, a, t a subway booth, token booth. They don't have many more, but... I got in an argument, which was normal for New York City. If you don't get in an argument in New York City at least once a day, something's wrong with you. Uh, and I didn't know this. I'm from the Midwest, so it was very hard for me to get in an argument. Uh, but I did, and I got to the chamber, and, uh, and I closed the door, and my nervous system, you could actually hear it like grinding. I could just, it, it was so jarring to me that I had this thought, I've got to do something. And so I had this thought right then, well, maybe I could tune my nervous system like a musical instrument. So I ran downstairs to the music store and I got a couple tuning forks, ran upstairs, uh, tapped them on my knees, put them in my ears, and instantly, and do mean instantly, uh, the sound of my nervous system just immediately entrained, or we'd say, came into resonance with the sound of the two tuning forks. Uh, I was so excited about this. It was, it was, all, it was literally, I would call it a mystical experience almost. Uh, one that I'm still dealing with today, uh, of course, that was phenomenological. And then in 2002, I was able to go into, uh, finally go into the laboratory. We begin doing more reductionist empirical research. And then I got very interested in the effect of sound on neurotransmitters and especially uh, uh, nitric oxide and undamide. Uh, type transmitters. And, uh, they, and from there, I, over the years, I've written uh, several books, uh, several peer-reviewed research, uh, all of it geared towards how sound affects the nervous system and how to best use it. I remember at the time uh, at Bellevue, I ran at a clinic for drug addicts in the evening and I would take the tuning forks along with uh, ear acupuncture 
Uh, of course, um, we would do verbal work as well um, and body work. And I could do all of this because in, the, in those days, at least, no doctors ever stayed past four o'clock in the hospital. So my drug, my drug clinic was at seven and nobody cared. <laughs> so I was doing body work, tuning fork, sound, music, everything. And my addicts were just doing wonderful with the, with the work with the sound. Uh, and then I began planning, uh, doing works with the, looking at the amygdala, the limbic system, and looking at post-traumatic stress and how, how sound and music could affect post-traumatic stress. And then over the years, that's just been my way of integrating the sound work with my clinical work in, in psychology and, and, and medicine. Uh, and I found that basically, in general, nonverbal therapies uh, work far better than verbal therapies, but there's certainly a place for verbal therapy. So I still will use you know, some verbal therapy when necessary. Uh, but normally most people get better just fine by being able to, I like to say that there's no way for everyone in the world, a little more relaxation is gonna help. Uh, and so we use sound along with um, integrated with touch work and so on to create a certain physiological state um, you know, that people can recover from many, many, anything for the most part. Uh, it's just a matter of you know, introducing it correctly with the right uh, therapeutic alliance, and it can take place. Um, I think also, I do, I teach around the world. I just got back from Europe. I teach every year. I go to Germany, Switzerland, uh, sometimes Spain. I've been to Italy. I've taught Italy many times. Um, I've taught uh, Denmark, Sweden, um, you know, I, and uh, you know, at, uh, London, England, all in Wales, and so on. Um, I, my corporation is, is Biosonics. It means uh, the life, life sound. Uh, we're very much into integrating uh, good research. And good research, I mean, it has to be peer-reviewed, evidence-based, you know, something that, that at least brings the field into a whole new perspective. Not that I'm not for, and, and I'm very much into the new research and intuition, which is all unbelievable. Uh, we'll find that a lot of things we thought were flaky five years ago, in fact, have the research now is just off the charts for it. Uh, you know, so you know, these are what's, that's what's important to me. It's, it's the whole field of sound healing, not just what I do. So my research is for everybody, always has been. Uh, and when I hear everybody talk, I get excited because I've been doing this for nearly 45 years uh, and there was nobody to talk to. <laughs> so I started teaching. <laughs> I, I did everything in secret in those days. <laughs> but now, now I see there's so many people talking and doing things. It's, for me, it's like, a, it's like a dream come true, you know, um, to hear everything that people are looking into. And, um, and it's just very exciting you know, for me to be here and, and uh, and share, you know, and listen to everybody else sharing. So um, that's basically, you know, where I'm coming from. And, um, you know, whatever anybody's into, it has to do with sound and healing. Uh, like I say, it's, as long as there's at least some kind of way to relate it to human beings ethically, I'm all for it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, John. Well said. Really inspiring. I'm just so like... Um... I'm just sitting here on this, looking at this vast chasm of depth and knowledge <laughs> and mystery. And I want to say, you know, I awake, our whole, our whole thing is just using sound to heal. And so many of the things you guys are talking about, you know, I've experienced and experienced and, and the people that we work with. And I lead with phenomenology, you know, that's it. You know, for, if it works, then I'll try to figure out the science and put it together. But, you know, that's what really... Uh, uh, really excites me. So, Doug, do you have any comments? Or I, I kind of have a question that maybe could bring this all together, but why don't you get a shot yeah, at it? Yeah, I have, I have plenty of questions for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. in, in general, what I'm really interested in is the spiritual aspects of the work that you're all doing. Um, let me start with uh, Alexandra. Uh, I, I listened to this morning for my morning meditation, listen to a meditation that was on your website, a 51 minute piece that was just beautiful, began with uh, some, some toning, some chanting, uh, and then into a series of different instruments, the, the bells and gongs. And I found myself just transported by the series of overtones and things in this music. So 
was was in, incredible. Um, Thank you. I wanted to say that I appreciate your approach to encouraging us to participate in that way and that uh, using sound as a meditation object is a brilliant way of getting us out of conceptualization. So it was a wonderful experience. And I wonder how, how that um, plays out for you in terms of the instruments you choose and the overtone frequencies that are there and the beats and relationships between them. Have you found things that work better or that are that? Yeah. <clears throat> so um, my background is meditation. Um, I started practicing at age 14 and uh, I realized how much it impacted my life. But also what encouraged me to approach sound practice through meditation is um, the various experiences, direct experiences that I had with music as a musician, as a conductor, as a composer, or as a listener who wasn't just exposed to Western music. As I said earlier, my training is classical and jazz. But of course, I played various things from pop rock, bluegrass, and, and blues, and so on. But later on, I got into playing non-Western music, specifically Turkish and Arabic classical musics, uh, when I was studying ethnomusicology. And there, my brain had to undergo complete different refurbishing and, and uh, becoming aware of different ways of experiencing music, different ways of listening, different ways of playing. My primary instrument is contrabass for all these years. You know, you, you practice to play in tune, now I had to play between the notes. So, uh, but it resonated with me. It's amazing how much the body recognizes what we need to get adjusted to. Now, the other part is uh, that uh, studying in different harmonic systems, uh, doing field work in over 40 countries and learning to play these different um, musical uh, styles and traditions, I realized how much listening, deep listening is important, but also the reliance on the finer mathematics. Also, how much human beings are obsessed and always gravitate toward using constructing instruments that emit harmonic overtones to clearly audible level. As we know, overtones are everywhere, but most of the time we don't hear them because the fundamental frequency overshadows the, the overtones. But sound practitioners, for me, that's a better term than sound healers because I'm very persnickety when it comes to choosing the right words because words have consequences. Uh, I do believe, as many scholars, researchers said, that the word exists because we have a language for it. And we probably all know how deep and esoteric the science of sound can become and how sound is at the root of all the religions and philosophies, right. the word in the Bible, the logos, the primordial om, music of the spheres, so on and so forth. That sound, for some reason, is the creator of this reality. So I'm, I'm very interested in how human beings intuitively, subconsciously gravitate toward constructing instruments, even going to the great lengths of dealing with metallurgy, which is sophisticated chemistry, to mix different uh, metals to get an alloy where when you hit, you get a overtones, you get a bunch of overtones, singing bowl, disc bell, gong, and so on. But not only that, also in sub-Saharan Africa, and even in Central and South America, they construct a lot of instruments where there's buzzing. And in the buzzing or rattling, there's also overtones. And when they play these instruments, they tell you, we're calling on the ancestors, we're calling on the spirits. Mm -hmm. For me, that's a question of semantics. I'm deeply spiritual, and I'm very, very interested in what spirituality is. Now, the reason why I don't call myself a sound healer, with all due respect to uh, people who call themselves, because when we work with someone, we're not healing them, we are facilitating healing. So for me, healing facilitator is more appropriate uh, than calling myself a healer, and especially with all the pitfalls that people tend to fall into, and that's the human condition. That, you know, when every time we deal with a powerful tool, whether that be yoga, meditation, sound, and so on, there's a set of, of, of pitfalls. Ego inflation is on top of the chart. Spiritual bypassing, spiritual um, materialism, and, and uh, others messianic you know visions so i'm i'm really interested in 
how we can learn from human beings, from their intuition and to explore one's intuition because we don't have the science yet to really truly understand sound and frequencies the way we'd like to. Mm -hmm. When we align our intentions and intention, will and awareness, I think we can forge the way because that's how humans have always worked toward discovering that which consciousness needs to expand itself. We are all different portals of the same consciousness. And we're all programmed, encoded with the truth, encoded with, with a compass within us to lead us toward the truth. So yes, I'm trained over 12 years and four degrees in music and I have a lot of experiences. Yeah, yeah. Also, I became deeply interested in why sound is used in all shamanic ceremonies, why sound is used in holistic practices and in Eastern philosophies, the mantra and sutra systems that chants. Uh, in why Buddhist monks sing, overtones singing, diaphonic singing. So all these things, there's always overtones. Overtones is what we resort to. So this tells us that there's something in the overtones as gateway to enhance one's spirituality, to gain connectedness to the higher self, the spirit world, whatever you want to call it. I'm not someone who is big on exteriorization. I do understand that shamanic societies always talk about spirit. You know, you eat mushroom and you start journeying and the mushroom has spirit. The mushroom is healing you. Same with ayahuasca. That's called exteriorization in psychology. That's, uh, that works for someone who does not know how complex reality is and quantum physics and neuroscience and biochemistry and hermeticism and Gnosticism and all these things. So I'll take a multidisciplinary approach to really understand something so immense like sound. Why? Because it's the number one tool to expand consciousness, to enhance our connectedness to the higher self, to, to the highest. And that's why it's used in, in all religious services and shamanic ceremonies and Eastern philosophies. So I use intuition. I don't claim to tell you to, to know, you know, oh, I use this frequency to do this. You know, this, the, the moon gong is for this and this and that. The Saturn gong, I, I, it's all unconfirmed rumors and wishful thinking. And there's a lot of that in sound, unfortunately. Why? Because, you know, we have a strong desire to want to know. We love to claim that we know. I call this monobibliosis. <laughs> the disorder of becoming an expert after having read one book. And this happens to every person. So I'm very cautious not to do this. And also people have had one experience and they claim to be expert. I've had many powerful shamanic ceremonies. I don't repeat the same things that others say as to what seems to be happening. I don't buy word to word what the shaman is telling me. I've worked a lot with various shamans interested in uh, learning why they use sound, what is the function of sound, mm -hmm. how it works with uh, plant teachers or entheogens or psychedelics. What is that about? Well, psychedelics itself, you know, it means the, the revealing or manifesting the mind. And that has been an obsession of all societies, shamanic or non-shamanic. Mm -hmm. If we take the use of um, uh, soma in the Vedas, and we now know most certainly it was psychedelic or kikyon in the ancient Hellenistic period in the Lucinian mysteries for 2000 years, they drank a kikyon, which is uh, made out of uh, LSD-like alkaloid, from uh, ergot okay so i'm interested in receptors I'm interested in sound and chemicals to alter the transducing effect of consciousness in the brain and the heart so i don't honestly know exactly what frequency is good for that all i know is that i need to engage the person in the experience it's a it's a collaboration i'm not healing them i'm there to help them heal themselves by creating a protocol, creating awareness, sharing with them how to listen, how to get the mind out of the way, meditation, very, that's the most difficult part, how to tap into the concept of ethos, which is the describing character, the emotional state that sound can evoke within the person. And this is what the concept of raga is about. And the concept of makam, which is used in all ancient musical cultures that continue to exist. So what we have basically is a mode which you can describe it, you know, kind of like a scale and with notes and intervals between the notes. And this is where you have the mathematical ratio. So a fifth, the distance between C and G is three to two ratio. A second is nine to eight ratio, major second to be specific. A third is 55 to three ratio and so on and so forth. So 
a specific raga or major scale, minor scale, or makamat or modes are different set of intervallic structures, mathematical ratios that, what do they do? Temper the way we perceive reality. And this is how intelligence manifests in nature with mathematical systems, very sophisticated one. Think fractal geometry, Fibonacci series, the harmonic overtone series has been described as the living God. It's the most esoteric of all of them. That's why we use harmonic overtones. And the concept of ESO then focusing on the microtonality and letting go, becoming part of the sound as a dimension. So I work more as an intuitive. I work with a lot of attention to phenomenology paying attention, paying attention to how we pay attention to learn from the self. And, and really, uh, I learn a lot from people I work with. And so far, I work with over 12,000 people in various settings. And these people helped me so much to add my knowledge, to my knowledge, what I know about sound to help more others. I've done a lot of scientific studies with EEG, with heart rate variability. And, uh, you know, my training in music helped me so much. Uh, I studied theory and also the field work, going around and work and note, studying how people have used sound and try to figure out why and see what kind of mirroring there is and uh, similarities. So I trust in human beings and the intuition and imagination is what I use a lot to arrive to these conclusions. So, no, I don't claim, you know, that this frequency is good for that, this ethos is good for that, or this, you know, we are doing our best. Mm -hmm. Given that we don't have the science yet, we have to trust what we have within us because the divine is within us. And the healer, teacher archetypes can come out in, in these direct experiences where you know, always leave room for yeah, and I think I think we're basically talking about this mystery, okay? And we have our science and all this stuff. We're talking about a great mystery, and we try to come up with with more effective metaphors as we learn and learn. But basically, we're still we're dealing with the great mystery, and that's one of the, you know, awe is one of the the primary things of a mystical experience, and music is one of those things that evokes that. And I want to throw out a question to everyone here from what you were saying. Um, you know, there's a and I'm a, I'm a performer. I'm a musician, and so. You were talking about deep listening and participation. So you're creating these sounds through your body, like you were talking about through your voice and whatnot. But when you have deep listeners, you know, that are that are really receptive to what's coming out of you, all of a sudden that starts to create, I mean, it evokes a new depth in the person who's producing it. And then if they begin in a skillful way to co-participate, you begin to sing harmonies together, do polyrhythmic things together, or just sing or whatever that is, that creates, a, that creates a field. That is why everybody goes to concerts still. And with all our technology, live music has not died. And I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I've ever heard of a culture or isolated tribe in the middle of God knows where who does not have music. I mean, it just seems to be one of the most essential things of human being. And even though the big record companies have kind of taken a hit because of the internet and all this free music or cheap music, the, the love and the, the, the draw to music. And I think, you know, I suffered from depression many years. And I think that one of just like with nature, when I hear music and it doesn't move me, I know I'm off, you know, uh, like I, I live in a beautiful wilderness area. When I look at the mountains and the light and I can't see it, I know something's closing down in me. And of course I've been using sound to, to get me into these states. So, so is there anything that, you know, and this is like to everybody, what is it about sound and what is it about sound when it's shared and what is about sound when it's co-participated or music co-participated in the creation of spontaneously or, or any other way? I'll begin. Um, one of the things we really haven't <clears throat> talked about is for me, Again, I'm not music, I'm vibration. And so if all I look at in the world is this wave of energy, every cell in your body is its own vibrational sound, every atom moving down all the way to the quark movement, which has also been now shown to create a sound, everything has its own frequency. And so very important is the persons, the individuals, vibrational cellular sounds on a larger scale. And so the way I look at each person from their cells, you can't put your hand 
to your ear and hear that, your brain understands it. And John had that experience when he was in the anechoic chamber after a period of time, you can pick up your cellular sounds. So it's your brain that's directing what I call your signature symphony of sound. That's your symphony. So you are producing this, your own music and it resonates or does not resonate with the person next to you. If you, as a musician, produce a beautiful compilation of a variety of frequencies and tones, it will impact many people in the group, but it doesn't always mean it'll impact everyone in the group the same way. Because when a cell is vibrating and giving out sound, it's searching for something to give it balance. So in my work, I am always looking at um, the way the sound cell frequencies are contained in your voice, which tells me the direction to look at in the body. But now I can tell the very specific spontaneous autoacoustic emission that you then auto-tone back to your body. Auto-toning involves proper breathing, meditation, production of sound in a specific way, getting the molecules and the cells to vibrate to start a cyclical effect to change how the math of all the rest of the cells are working for their own algorithm to become balanced. So for me, when I look at it, sound is the essence of your body. We have many body rhythms and patterns that shape us. Our voice reflects our inner soul and the way we respond to the world around us. And then this voice your brain connection or that subtle energy system I mentioned actually defines our ability to balance everyday life for us. And so it is within this everyday balance that our being evolves and exists. And so when that is that evolution allows for us the possibility to become whatever we want and become one in balance with interconnectedness with both our life, with the earth and our own spiritual self. So we can, re we can achieve our own inner harmony when we've created that balance. So for me, I address where the imbalances are and then choose which method. I no longer do all the methods. I actually refer to practitioners now who will use my Davis model the way I want it done. Um, and so they do the therapies, they come back to me and I help monitor the guidance of the pathway. So spiritually, we can evolve to our best spiritual self as we allow, you mentioned consciousness, as we allow the spirituality and the consciousness to break those barriers. I know myself, I stop myself, I have to do something now and thinking, oh, that's my mind telling me, what, are, what is my real spirit telling me to do? And I follow that course. It's much more balanced and I'm much happier and I'm, I feel much better as a result of it. And I try to relay that and share that with all the people that I work with. Thank you. Anybody else? Whatever, whatever percolates in your brilliant minds and hearts and bodies, just let it rip, it's fine. Well, can I say something? Sure. First, Alex and I, we, we both like overtones, I know that for sure, and math, <laughs> there's no doubt mm -hmm. about it. Um, and certainly, you know, I make tuning forks for all the overtone series, all the Fibonacci series, uh, uh, you know, because I'm really into people, the other words, I think the more sound you can, you can, you can bypass the amygdala, go directly to the thalamus, you're going to go right to the third ventricle, you're going to listen, in other words, the more sound you can get in there, the better. Uh, sounds make us more flexible, more creative. Uh, the idea of a 12-tone musical scale, scale in today's world is ridiculous. Uh, you know, I mean, the idea of music, you know, is, is in, really in the, in the mind of the beholder. For, I can go listen to car horns and find beautiful music. So we call that mindful listening. So anything that one can listen to without activating the amygdala. For, for example, if I'm in an airport, and there's one of those beep, beep, beep things going by, you know, it wakes, it, get, it activates my amygdala. I'm going to look around to make sure I'm safe. But once I realize I'm safe, I'm going to go into a mindful listening state and I could have a spiritual experience, a musical spiritual experience, you listen to beep, 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 like that. And I have, I've actually found that some of these little, 
what looks like at the physical level, some kind of cart going by could actually take me to altered states of consciousness. And in our research, we're showing that basically, if you listen, mindfully listen, you're going to, your body is going to create molecules very similar to tryptamine molecules and so on you find in ayahuasca, LSD, uh, also anandamide molecules, so THC, 1, 2, type 3 molecules, all of this is from listening. So the idea of spiritual states, uh, to me, are, I don't think, I think of them as normal states, to tell you the truth. Uh, and that if one listens to anything mindfully, uh, safely, then that sound's going to take you where you need to be uh, naturally. Uh, it's going to give you insights and new possibilities. It's just that we get, in a way, stuck in our, uh, many of my patients, I've seen this, you know, they get stuck in their view of reality, their belief system. Uh, but if you could relax them, run frequencies through, uh, eventually it changes their whole neural pathways. Next thing you know is they're thinking differently without having to tell them. In other words, like, if you tell somebody verbally to do something, it's the biggest waste of time in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I said to you, stop smoking, you know, give me a break, you know, or eat this way, or do this, or do that, and here's the science, you need to eat that way, here's the science, you're going to have lung cancer, you just you don't stop smoking. Uh, my favorite is the doctor says, well, you need to eat differently, and you leave the office. Uh, so, in other words, you can tell people verbally all you want, and the chances of it working are pretty much zero, uh, whereas if you could go in non-verbally, and you can begin to change body structure through manipulation. You begin to change the way that the neural circuits fire uh, through sound, for example. And again, the Fibonacci series, the overtone series, all these are natural. Your body grows to the Fibonacci series. And you're dealing with microtones that most people wouldn't call musical. You know? But when you learn how to let these frequencies run through, you actually, it becomes like a nada yoga for the synapses in your brain. It's what really, you're really stretching your synapses uh, in a, so that when you come into different areas of life that you would have rejected before, and all of a sudden you go, wow, I can see everything differently. I'm more flexible. I can't tell you how many patients that I've done this with, they come back and they start saying, oh, I read this book on this and that. Uh, why didn't you tell me about it? And of course, my answer is, if I would have told you about it, you would never read it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so therefore, I don't even bother telling anybody about anything. I figured it's got to come. That's the idea of, of sound. When we listen mindfully, it actually, you think of it going into the limbic system, into the auditory thalamus. Uh, and then what happens is, is that you make changes from the inside out, not from the outside in. Because from the inside out, you become more flexible, more responsive, more creative. Uh, your states of awareness have increased. So then you'll quite naturally be attracted to things that are going to be, in a way we say, healing for you. And healing is used in the word in the context to make more whole and more complete. So we naturally will be attracted to that which makes us whole and complete. Uh, and, and also creates ecstasy, which gets us outside of our little limited, you know, ego yeah. well, uh, sack, if you will. In, in psychology, we call that euphoric stress. Yeah. Uh, you know, that you, you have a sense of euphoria. That's where the anandamide type molecules come in. Anandamide means bliss, molecules of bliss. And this is science language. Can you imagine the scientists that figured out that wording? I mean, it's, oh, let's call it ananda, which means bliss, mind. Mm. Uh, and so one now has the experience of, of euphoric molecules within the body. Uh, and that, but that euphoric experience, you have to be careful when you come to what I call mystical language and so on, because it all gets put in a certain cultural context. And then you have arguments over, well, this, you know, this culture is better than that culture. This culture had a better idea. So I always try to look for what's neutral uh, and, and transcends different cultural views of things. So we look at the principles and not necessarily the belief systems that may or may not work. Uh, so you know, I study Ayurvedic medicine, Western medicine, natural, but underneath of that, all medicines, there's a certain principles. Uh, like, I like to say that if it's a thousand years ago, people had stress. You know, they had to worry about the Romans invading or whatever. Uh, now we have to worry about Donald Trump talking or whatever, uh, tweeting, you know, so 
you know, you know, so we have uh, the vagal nervous system has your social anxiety and so on. Uh, but still, we got to deal with it. We got to relate to it. And the more flexible we are, the more creative we are, the better we are in terms of relating to what's going on. Uh, you know, that's and sound. I can't think of a, it's one of the best tools in the world if it's introduced correctly to make us more flexible, creative human beings. It's, Amen. Is there is there anybody have a working definition of what music is? Well, yeah. While we're talking about it, it's like a, what is God? You know, uh, Hel Hel Helen Bonney. Uh, Hel Helen Bonney calls music a structured envelope of sound. And you said you just like the beeping cart can be music. So somewhat, That's, it's in the ear of the ear of the uh, listener. Uh, you label it music or something, but it, it all goes back to sound, huh? You know, it's you like some Cage and Zanakis. That's uh, some pretty unusual music, to be sure. Yes, normal. <laughs> yeah. fact, we, I think people need to get out of their their musical habits and always listen to different and different musics. Uh, you know, certainly if we look at Stravinsky's Riot of Spring, when he premiered it, people rioted, and yet now everybody goes to the opera to hear it. I, I remember when I was a kid that Elvis Presley was shown from the waist up, and now you, you know, uh, and my parents, when they first heard blues music, thought the devil was after me. Uh, but now all these things have become more normal, and I think we're going to, more and more microtonal kind of qualities are going to be introduced. I think the more the better. Uh, because we live in a world of vibrations. Therefore, the more vibrations we can conduct, the better off we are. And, and we also live in a time of, of almost everything that's ever been recorded being available to yeah, almost everything. everybody who wants to listen to it. It's like, you know, and the, the guys that, as far as in my blues, you know, practice that it were the, you know, my heroes, they were, they had, you know, 45 records and 33 records and 78 God knows and little needles and listening and trying to, to, to rip off these, these riffs. And now it's just everything is available. And I'm finding it's really harder and hard. You know, I have satellite radio in my car, which is amazing. And I have Apple music and I go to YouTube and I listen to all this stuff. And there's just this, this global cross fertilization of sound and music now. And I don't know what that means, but I think it has to be something positive. And I think, just what we're talking about here that maybe we are we are um in a time of great change where a bunch of things are starting to come together and it's certainly the the kind of the intuitive hit that i've taken away from all these interviews that we've done with with uh the spiritual technology summits that we've been doing and this is one of the more amazing ones that i have and again i feel like i'm in an ice cream store with like different flavors of genius and I get to take a little, you know, and I, 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 I want to eat the whole thing or mix it all together in some great, you know, Sunday or something. So one of, one of the things that maybe we can accomplish here is to just to give the listeners a taste of who you guys are. You know, there are people like you out here doing amazing things. And we normally ask people to, you know, give some kind of experiential thing so they can go and, and, uh, sample your work and i'll certainly be looking you up more if, if you uh if you look at who goes to your websites and stuff i want i want to know more about this and how we can incorporate it to what we're doing at i awake so is there anything maybe we can just kind of sum this up and i, I just apologize that we didn't have like an eight hour block here uh sum this up you know what what people can do to, uh, just to most directly get a sense of, of what you what you guys are about and the work that you're doing. And uh, we'll just go around and, and uh, you can say your website. And when we edit this, we'll put this, it up on the screen so everybody can be in touch with you. And hopefully many more people, or at least some more people, will, will get to know you guys and your work will just have more resonance and more more um, ability to, to do this powerful work that you're doing in the world. So, Mine is soundmeditation.com. Um, and... I have a lot of valuable information on it, um, scientific studies, articles that I've written, and um, harmonic spectrum analyses, uh, video lectures, podcast interviews that uh, different podcasts have done with me, and beefy section with resources, and um, some uh, sounds to listen to i have not uploaded six albums i recorded a year and a half ago i've been so busy and procrastinating i'm sorry but um they will be up at some point soon if or if anyone is interested in getting them they can send me an email to my website and get them directly from me i can send them to them uh, via download these are various tracks for sound meditation using the most advanced technology as we all know overtones which give uh, the timbre or tone color are the hardest to capture 
Uh, so I used six microphones to record gong, for example, in many sophisticated microphone and consulting with several sound engineers and acoustical engineers. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's what I do and I facilitate sound meditation. I'm writing a book, uh, but I've been so busy with giving lectures, teaching, that continuing the research and doing field work and yeah. Where, where, Alexander, where's your home? You're the only person I didn't really catch um, where you're New York. coming from. New York. New York right. City. Brilliant. The land of noise. <laughs> the land of constant <laughs> vibration. <laughs> I live in north tip of Manhattan on the last block, literally. My building is the northwest corner of Manhattan. Brilliant. By water. I, you were French. Park. I don't know why. I thought you were French. Uh, my name is French, but I'm originally Lebanese, French speaking. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. On pourrait, on pourrait parler français. Oui, bien sûr. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Yeah. Go ahead, John. Oh, you want me to? Want me, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> my website is biosonics, B I O S O N I C S dot com. And if you go there, there's lots of, lots of free things. For one, there's a, a lot of tapes I did for my patients over the years. Uh, that are free for anybody. There's tunings, there's recordings that are free. Uh, we, sell, we do sell tuning forks. Uh, my books are on there, Human Tuning, Music and Sound to Healing Arts, uh, a book about Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital and my experiences. Uh, you know, and we try to make as much available as possible. I also want to say that I'm excited because I wrote with a, a psychiatrist a friend of mine. Uh, uh, we wrote... Uh, uh, David, uh, David uh, Perez Martinez, we wrote the first uh, sound healing chapter for a medical textbook for doctors. Uh, we also. Well, they need it. Doctors need a lot of help. Well, not to mention their patients, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think certainly uh, learning how to meditate, mindfully listen, and so on would be a, a great addition to many uh, Offices. I always thought when I go to a doctor's office, it'd be nice if you just sit and they taught you how to listen to sound and meditate, and mm -hmm. then you go in to see your doctor. Uh, I'm sure we get some different biochemistry coming back. Uh, so anyway, we, we've written that, and we've also just wrote a chapter for a new. Uh, I, I wrote a chapter for a psychology textbook. The main thing is we're starting to see all this work go mainstream. There's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, and I, like I said, I've been doing it for 45 years, and I, I know I feel the pull of it. Uh, and we're all part of that, you know, so it's, it's exciting that it's happening. Uh, so in, in, on my website, I try to keep people informed about, you know, everything I know at least that's going on and, and do my best to help everybody else. So that's what, that's what I do. I'm, I've been doing it my whole life. I'm not going to stop. So <laughs> let's keep chugging along. Right? However, I must say, it's not uh, a secret. My website is yeah, is written in the in the site of innovators, but it's in Italian. That's a problem. I have to translate all in English. However, in the bibliography, there are many texts in English. So if you want to go and give a look, uh, uh, if you click on the name of the authors, uh, it appears either the full text or the abstracts that I have uh, published in this. Uh, and if you want a humorous experience, just put Google Translate on and see what comes up. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there is a short, uh, a short text that I have written in Italian that resumes in a sort of in 20 pages my research on the AVS system, not on the last uh, device that is via headphone. However, what I think about this is, uh, is uh, is available also for the headphone device. Uh, and I can send it. With Google Translate, you can translate it. Okay, great. It may not be art, but we'll get the we'll get the message, yes? Or who yeah. knows? Maybe it'll be, you know, some phenomenal. You, yeah. Directly. Yeah, we would love that. We'd love that. We'll put it up we'll, when this comes out, we'll we'll put out that information and all the context stuff. Maybe there is some some willing people who wants to translate one page and another one, another one, and, and I give a look and I say if the translation is correct and we can share it. Brilliant. All right. And Doreen, uh, last but definitely not least. 
Well, I have five websites, but probably the one that you can find out the most information in is thedaviscenter.com. Um, I have six books. My most recent just came out two weeks ago called um, Say It With Sound, Hum, Harmonize, and Heal. Um, that's an easier book. I have other ones. Of the two other most important ones for sound are The Cycle of Sound, A Missing Energetic Link, um, and Sound Bodies Through Sound Therapy. Um, I have YouTube videos. I used to do a CBS alternative radio, alternative wellness show called Sound Effects with Doreen Davis, which I know are archived somewhere. Um, right now, my work is really in, I would like to share it with someone who would like to take it further as I really want to put it down into a more of a, a teachable kind of a thing. But I can't really do that till my patent gets developed and that'll probably take some time. And then my test is also in that process. So we'll get there. Thank but you very you much. You can find it on, you have to Google my name correctly. You'll find the books. <laughs> right. Hey, uh, Brother Doug, you have anything you'd like to close out with? I am so grateful to have been a part of this and have so much to think about now. I'm inspired to go play. I'm inspired to go create. I'm inspired to go listen. And there's so much wonderful information shared here. Thank you all for coming and for being a part of this. I intend to continue to study each of your work more and more as time goes on here. So thank you all. Thank Brilliant. You. Thank you very much. Thank you.